thanks to everyone for being here this morning. Uh, if you are joining us from somewhere else in the world, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I, I count it a very big privilege to interact with scholars. And I'm also happy that I'm not a scholar. <laughs> because your job, of my job, they are difficult in different ways. Um, but today, the issues I'll be looking at, I mean, after listening to the past uh, yesterday and today to so many uh, work, presentations on food issues, I really can see that a lot more work needs to be done you know, to tackle the hunger problem in the world. And again, it confirmed to, to me that people are not hungry because there's no food, but because of many, many, many factors. So this morning I'll be speaking about, um, as you can see on the, on the screen, climate justice, as well as ecological justice. But before I proceed, I would like to read a fragment of a poem. This poem is titled, Choked by Convenience. But the segment I'm reading is on convenience and greed. I believe that these are the two things that are driving the world in the wrong direction. People don't want anything that changes the way they do things, and people are greedy for more than what they need. Convenience and greed, the two thieves between whom we are crucified. Here lies the deaf generation, wedded to the catwalks of lies, denying the shouts of Mother Earth, addicted to efficient destruction, bedeviled by ease, addicted to speed, a world on a mad rush to the tipping point. Roaring temperatures, raging floods, roaring fires, maddening droughts, dissatisfied deserted lands, oceanified polluted swamps. Eyes open, we link arms, we build barricades, Solidarity erases greed. It's a time to embrace the inconvenience and hit the core of Mother Earth. That more or less summarizes my presentation this morning. <laughs> so if I sit down, if I choose to sit down, please understand with me. Um, we, we've heard this over and over again, but it's never too much to remind ourselves that we are just a tiny fragment of nature. Humans may be one of the weakest part of nature. We are few, but we are very destructive. And so some, often humans tend to think that we are not part of nature. And that mindset, that we're superior to nature, we're not part of nature, we can improve nature, we can make nature more efficient, we can make nature more productive. That mindset has given humans the license to do things that are against our interest and the interests of other beings who share the planet with us and whose well being actually builds our own well being. And the destru destruction of whom creates a lot of problems for us, including pandemics and what else may come. Now, I come from Africa, and we have a long history that tends to suggest that Africa came into history when it had a contact with the outside regions, or that the African history started with colonialism or pre colonialism the wars, the conquest, in quotes. Or you see, Thomas Sankara said that you can fight effectively only against things that you understand well. And you can't win unless you are convinced that your fight 
is just. Steve Biko of South Africa said a people without a positive history is like a vehicle without an engine. Now, these two quotations guide my thinking about many things. About climate change, biodiversity losses, the multiple crises in the world. And of course, it helps to confirm to me that the multiple crises must be understood. Um, one from the systems, systems approach that we all had yesterday, uh, but also by deep understanding of where we are coming from and a clear projection of where we're going to. And one key thing is that we have to recover our memories. You know, the, when we forget we're part of nature, it means that we've really forgotten something. We've lost our mind. It's a state of madness. So we need to recover our memory in terms of so many dimensions, cosmological, cultural, technological, organizational. And somewhere along, before I conclude, I will see a few examples of local technologies that have been ignored to our own detriment. Now, you know, in the world today, we've exceeded the ceilings in many dimensions. The, you know, this do not, this famous do not uh, principle um, that we, we've sunk below the social foundation. And of course, the ecological ceiling is being exceeded in very critical areas. Now, to remind ourselves how small we are, think about a healthy soil. Many of you are food agricultural experts. The healthier the soil, the better the food production, right? Am I right? <laughs> you don't want to talk to me. <laughs> okay, so the healthier the soil, the, the easier, the more likely it is that you're going to produce good food. But healthy soil also cools the planet. And I think this is one of the reasons that Labia Campesina campaigns for agroecology, the system of food production that works with nature and also builds healthy soils. And so you people blame agriculture for being a major contributor of greenhouse gases that is causing the crisis. But we never say what kind of agriculture. We need to be specific. What kind of agriculture is the problem? Because agroecology will cool the planet give us good food and give us good health. Now, a healthy teaspoon or spoonful of soil contains millions of microorganisms. And so when we use chemicals to make our lands more efficient, to kill pests, to kill whatever, we are destroying millions, millions of organisms that can actually help us to live better and make our lives better. I'm sure, I'm sure some people would like to kill the microorganisms living inside our bodies if they could. Maybe drink pesticides or herbicides so they would say we don't have bacteria living inside us. Nobody wants to say, oh my goodness, how could I have bacteria inside my body? But part of our bodies, a whole chunk of us is made up of communities of other beings that we don't see, that we need to respect. And so our concern for about climate change, about biodiversity, uh, and for justice, not just justice for humans, it's justice for humans and other beings, some of whom we think are non-living, but which may be more living than we are, just because we don't really know everything. So the way we relate to nature, you know, how do you feel when you step into nature? When you step, I mean, when you step, you are, we are part of nature. But when I use nature in this sense, when you step into uh, a garden or a forest or you jump into a river, how do you feel? How do you relate to the other beings? How do you relate to the fishes, to the, to the birds, to the insects? The way we relate to those other beings also correlates to the way we relate to one another. You know, some human beings, if it's possible to use pesticides to, to, to remove, to delete other human beings, they will quickly do it. And people do do it through warfare. 
Imagine shooting people you don't even know just because you are paid to do that. And you are given a command to do that. So with that foundational conversation, we go down back to our topic. But we need to have the base to discuss what we want to discuss. So ecological justice, or oh, climate justice, environmental justice, they all talk about the same thing, the same uh, different facets of the same issue. We have a duty to ensure that things are okay with us and things are well with others. Climate justice demands that those who contribute the most to the problem should also do the most to tackle the problem. That's a simple, simple way to explain it. And ecological justice demands restoration and reparation. I just came, Till mentioned I just came from the US. Uh, we spent two weeks in four cities talking about rep reparations and look at different kinds of reparations, slavery, colonialism, ecological damage, all kinds of plunder that has happened in the world. And we also discuss about uh, re reproductive reparation. That was my first time hearing about reproductive reparation, but I think it's significant because, um, you know, gender justice demands that we recognize our, our roles and duties. So when we have restoration and reparation, we, we develop, we promote wellness and well being. This is one, con one thing that has that has been of major concern for me and my colleagues at Health of Mother Foundation uh, for some time now. How do we bring about healing to traumatized communities and individuals? And our conclusion is that we have to do what is required by the African Charter on People and Human Rights, Article 24, which states that every African you can extend it to every human being has a right to a safe and satisfactory environment in which to develop. So when my environment is polluted, my right to life is directly challenged. So we need, we get well, and we get well when we are free from disruptions, exploitation, and corruption. So in some, when we talk about climate change has become so topical, that's because it's it captures so many challenges, captures so many things that we are, uh, that are problems in the world, structural problems, which is best grouped as polycrisis, multiple crises. There are different words for it. But I think this word, although it was first used some many years ago, is becoming more popular these days to discuss the, the, the complex issues we are facing. And the structural crisis we have in the world today is driven by greed, as I said, and it's a failure of the market and a failure of capitalism. And so we're having energy deficit, we're having food deficit, financial crisis, social tensions, and all kinds of issues. Now, climate justice has or injustice have persisted because those who should do something are willfully blind to the situation. And so we have all the crises. The, the recent example being the floods in Pakistan, as well as the floods in Libya that swept off whole communities and washed people into the sea. And we don't even, we're not even able to know how many people perish because of restrictions by those who wield political power, who are blocking access to journalists and researchers into the areas of disaster. Last year, there was a major flooding in Nigeria. Some of my colleagues were trapped where they were in the field and they were trapped by the flood. They couldn't come out, roads were broken, things were lost. So when they managed to call me, I said, well, you are struck there, you can't come back. So you stayed and do some work. <laughs> I mean, that was a bit harsh, but that's what we did. So while you are struggling with the villagers on how to survive the flood, do some work, gather some data, 
find out from them how they're coping, watch what they're doing to survive. And they did that and we published a book, A Barefoot Guide to Coping with Floods. So we work in difficult circumstances, but we must also be ready to learn from what the struggles that we are in and the challenges we are facing at every time. We can complain, but we must also find solutions. So next, when the flood, we know the flood will come again. Flooding has started again in Nigeria as we speak. So those communities already, and so others can learn. This is what happened, this is how we did it. And so they can, uh, they're able to survive. Now, so what is driving global warming? What is driving global warming? Many factors, of course, but the biggest is the burning of fossil fuels. And because the fossil fuel sector is so powerful, they have forced governments to never to mention that this is the major cause. So the Secretary of the UN can say all he wants, but when the UN convenes the Conference of Parties, which is often called the Conference of Polluters, they would meet and they will avoid the word. They will avoid the fact that the problem is created by our dependence on fossil fuels and that we have to end the petroleum civilization. Willful, willful blindness. This photo is about an oil well about 10 kilometers offshore in Nigeria that burst into flames three years ago. As we speak, it's still burning and spilling. Three solid years. Three solid years burning and spilling. Can you imagine the amount of um, carbon or greenhouse gases that is going to the atmosphere uh, right now? Now, as we speak, you know, some people say that, well, we have to develop by any means necessary but we have not defined the development. Where do you want to go? What is it that you want? What system can you replicate and reproduce? The yearnings for growth that is undefined, but which is linear and vertical, has brought a lot of challenges to the world. A lot of problems, not just challenges. And so uh, using Africa as an example, you know, through the conferences of parties, there has been Clear the people are, the world was coming to grips with the fact that we have to shift from fossil fuels. Then suddenly, the war between Russia and Ukraine happened, and Europe began to modify what they're saying about fossil fuels. And I mean, the global north clearly they redefined. By one pipeline shot, we have to open another one. And Africa has been a convenient location for this new scramble for gas and for oil. And of course, African politicians say, well, we need the money. We need the money. And then they give a false argument that they need the money to develop, they need the money to provide energy. It's not true. They need the money for something else, which I don't know. If you know, you can tell me. <laughs> but just to illustrate what is going on, see, 93% of currently operating liquefied natural gas capacity on the continent is for export. Is that for Africans? Is for what? Export, right? And the additional what being planned, 84% of what is being planned is also for export. So you have a pipeline that will go from Niger Delta on the west coast of Africa all the way to Morocco. It's not stopping Morocco, it's coming to Europe. Another one is for the pass through the Sahara Desert from Niger Delta to, Al to Al Algeria, also to cross Mediterranean and come to Europe. The oil in Uganda is going from Lake Tukana, no, it's going from Lake Albert in Uganda to the coastline of Tanzania. Why is it going to the coastline? For export. The oil and gas found in Senegal at Salom Delta is also for export. Virtually, it's, it's a colonial arrangement. In the colony, the co colonial colonialism was a system, and it's still a system, that extracts, that extracts human beings, extracts finance, extracts resources for the capital, for the, the imperial base, and that is still going on today. So when anybody tells you we are extracting 
so as to provide energy is not true. Even the current discussion about, about um, green hydrogen or blue hydrogen or yellow or turquoise, they have different colors. And the green sounds really attractive. <laughs> and you know, the whole idea is that you cannot just harness solar power and transport it to another continent. But you can take solar power, split water into hydrogen and oxygen, cool it down, condense it, put it through pipelines and ship it, export it. So very soon you're going to be exporting the sun from different parts of the world to other places. Now, why did I say that? Well, just, just as a side talk, but these pipelines are promoting the burning of fossil fuels. Recent, look at the amount of gas pipeline, the length being planned, 20,000 kilometers planned gas pipelines. I think that, that may even be an, est, uh, an underestimate. Because in Niger Delta alone, we have about 21,000 kilometers worth of pipeline. Now, now check out this projection. This is a new, it's a, a forthcoming report by All Change International that just talks about how uh, the climate discussions is going to, uh, and actions will either meet the target uh, of 1.5 or, or well below two degrees. Now, if all the coal, that has been already found is burnt. We're going to exceed 1.5 degrees. If all the oil already found and gas are burnt, we're exceeding 1.5. If you burn all the fossil fuels already found, you are well shooting beyond two degrees. But I think this is even a very this is this is a very um, conservative projection. Because if you read the gap reports, production gap reports, and what the UNDP has been, UNEP has been issuing every year before the conference of parties, you find that the national, if countries do what they promise to do under the NDC, national determined contributions, we are going to shoot far, far, far above two degrees, maybe up to three or four or five degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by the middle of the century. And so the whole climate negotiation is based on a very faulty basis. And the mechanism for achieving the target is equally faulty. That is why right from uh, Paris, the debate on Article 6 is of the Paris Agreement is still ongoing because everyone is looking for what is the easiest and cheapest way to do? What can I do that would not really require me to do anything? So you want to do nothing. You want to do something by doing nothing. And now, so again, I come to Africa. I know you could extend these examples for, uh, we have good examples outside Africa. For example, in Yasuni, the Ecuadorians just voted on August 20 to keep the oil in the soil in Yasuni, which is a clear climate action and should be applauded and duplicated across the world. Now, in Africa, I've already touched on this. You have the ECOP, that's the pipeline from Uganda to Tanzania, Okavango Delta, straddling countries, Namibia, Botswana, and uh, it, all this being exploited by Recon Africa, a company from Canada. We have Salon Delta, uh, Niger Delta. You have St. Louis, Senegal. There's a lot of I was recently in Senegal in the communities that are, are challenged by gas exploration. And already there's a lot of climate displacement of populations internally in Senegal. By sea level rise, by coastal erosion, there are ref refugees. Actually in this city called St. Louis City, there are a lot of, a lot of refugees living in camps within that town. And so the migration we have is not just a standard forced migration, refugees leaving Africa across the desert, or across the Mediterranean Sea. There are refugees or climate refugees already being um, displaced within. And this is a photo I took at St. Louis. So it's at the Fisher folks from the shoreline you can see the gas installation. 
And once this begins to operate, the fisher folks, they try to displace the fisher folks right now because they always need a security buffer. This is solution, sometimes five kilometers radius. And it's just about seven kilometers offshore. And so if they're going to displace the fisher folks and that's their main area of operation and this would affect their livelihoods and create instability in that region because the fishers have determined that they're going to stay, they're not moving, that they should dismantle those things offshore. Uh, you know, of course, uh, who has, uh, what is going to happen? It's going to be a major area of conflict. Now, we talk about climate change and climate justice. Now, you, you carrying out activities that compounds the climate problem, that causes salinization of warming, the oceans are getting hotter, uh, you are destroying biodiversity, displacing, destroying livelihoods. And so the, the whole just, the one is feeding, climate, climate crimes are feeding ecological crimes. I mean, they're all interrelated. So the solution is leave the oil in the soil. I need to run. I think I've talked about this. Um, the, the whole six, not, not more than 60% of already proven reserves can be burnt. We are going to keep within the carbon budget. If you burn more than 60%, then forget it. Paris targets will just be a joke. Now, two men I thought I should mention that would, um, since many of us here are related, talk about food and agriculture. These are two men who have received the Right Livelihood Award. One is Tony Rinaldo, and the other is Yakuba Sawadogo. Now, Tony, Tony Rinaldo uh, is as popularized the farmer managed natural regeneration com uh, community driven reforestation regeneration farmer managed natural regeneration FMNG and how does it do that maybe you're already aware but let me just remind us there are many arid areas that piece of people forget that there were trees in those locations in many deforested areas, the trees have been cut, but the roots are in the soil. And the method he has found, which doesn't require much capital, it just requires knowledge and cooperation of farmers. If the roots are in the soil, you tend those roots and they come back to life. And by this, he has a lot of uh, arid areas in Niger Republic and many other places have been recovered through a simple system that doesn't require any high tech. You can Google him and read about him. The other man is Yakuba Sawadogo. You can look for him. There's a movie called The Man Who Stopped the Desert. And this man is very inspired. He doesn't have any college degree or anything. I'm not even sure if he has a high school degree, but he has spent his life using a local technology called Zai technology in Burkina Faso to build a forest in the Sahel. I went to visit him um, some years back. And he told me, I, went, I also went to the Ministry of Agriculture to find out how they're supporting him. And they're not supporting the, the only thing they told me that the forest is created is too thick for the Sahel. And so they should thin it out. And I thought that was, that was a good problem to have a thick forest in the Sahel. And it was a very creative way. He works with farmers in Burkina Faso, in Mali, in um, Niger Republic, and they have regular meetings. So that farmers, some of the farmers I spoke to said that with this technology, which is historical, is local, and it's so simple. If I mention it, you'll be saying, well, really, is that a technology? Uh, that because of that, they no longer worry about what, what kind of soil they have, what kind of land they have because they can make any land productive. That's something that should be popularized. For example, in the green, Great Green Wall to be built from Djibouti in East Africa to Dakar in West Africa, stretching a depth of 15 kilometers. If you use local mechanisms, you can actually grow that forest and not wait for exotic, exotic species. There's a book called uh, When the Sahara Was Green, 
Maybe you all need to look for it and read it. Very interesting stories. So the Sahara was not always a desert. It was once a place of rivers, of elephants and lions, and lush vegetation, and beautiful cultures. So these two men with little or nothing, and the exact technology is simple. Let me just explain it. It's a question of, you understand that rain, little rain falls in the Sahel, very little rain sometimes, occasionally, but you get to the land, you use stones to create a ridge, a bridge, put vegetative material. When the water comes, it's trapped with the, with the vegetative material. It fertilizes, it kind of uh, improves the quality of the soil and you can plant your crops. And that's simply just what they do. And it works like magic. And this man, has clay pots on trees on his land with water. And all the birds in the region are, are clever enough to know that there's water to drink in his forest. So they go there to drink from the pots on the trees. And as they go, they drop seeds they brought from elsewhere. So his forest is about the most diverse forest you could find in that region. Simple wisdom, which I think we need and not stuff like this, not geoengineering. Geoengineering simply means continue to pollute. We can capture, we talk about carbon removal, decarbonization. I think we should be talking about depetrolization. You know, geoengineering is about using technology to control the planetary thermostat, and it has a lot of, there are a lot of pitfalls. It's a question of power, it's a question of control, it's a question of who will suffer the consequences, it's a question of that you cannot carry out small scale experiments. It has to be at planetary scale, at very big scale, and it's risky and untested for that reason. Whether it means whitening the clouds by injecting sulfates into the clouds, you know, you whiten the clouds so that it reflects the solar radiation management reflects radiation to sky, or you can plant genetically modified trees who would either have white leaves so that a big forest or all the trees have white leaves and create the Alberto effect to reflect radiation back to space. And that would affect, of course, food loss. Maybe, maybe, maybe that would not be food loss, right? If you, <laughs> because you planted a tree to cool the planet, not, to, not for food to eat or anything, or you plant you genetically modified trees to be very efficient in chlorophyll so they absorb more carbon, you know, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, or you, you know, pump salt water from the ocean into the clouds, into the clouds to whiten the clouds, or you fertilize the ocean and trigger algae bloom to absorb more carbon and sink to the bottom of the ocean. Brilliant ideas, stuff that stories are made of. But you need to have this on massive scale. Some of them have been tested, of course. It's not all geoengineering. Geoengineering is cloud seeding for rainfall. That is already being done. It's no big deal. But what is proposed for managing radiation and managing the cooling planet is something that if you do this, of course, you're going to get all the carbon. But I think the industry will make a lot of money from manufacturing the infrastructure that is needed. Perhaps this is what they're really looking for, not whether it's going to work or not. It'll be lots of investment in manufacturing those things. But if you do this, the moment you stop it, you have to do it in perpetuity. If you stop in the future, maybe 50 years, 80 years, all the things you try to stop before will kick in again, right? To kick in again. So it's not a permanent solution. The permanent solution is we have to change our lifestyles. We have to. We have, to, we have to look at, we have to support the things that helps to build healthy environment. We have to change our lifestyles. We have to, um, we just have to inconvenience ourselves to reduce our footprint. I, I'm very hesitant, I didn't want to use the word footprint. But when you use footprint in relation to climate change, you bring a really problem down to the individual as if we are now the ones who created all the problem. But the problem is not just individuals, it's industrial, it's corporate problems and governments who have refused to take action. So my final thoughts is that 
Climate and ecological justice struggles are struggles for life. Struggles for liberation, to liberate ourselves and come back to our memory that we are part of nature. And we need to understand our stories, our histories. We need to reject neocolonialism, which Kwame Nkrumah described as um, in the last stages of imperialism. And we could say more about that. Then, of course, promote a rapid, just energy transition and insist on re reparation. And I'll just give a few more thoughts on this one more minute and I'm done. One of the greatest challenges in the cl climate action among nations is climate finance. Uh, it's been very, very difficult to get finance. They have the Green Climate Fund that promised to deliver $10.7 billion. It's not, been it's not been met. That target is not met. Never, ever met. Then the climate finance annually, that's supposed to be 100 billion US dollars. That is not being done. It's not being made available, except countries, the rich countries are trying to give us loans or measure, use other existing loans and processes to account for that. But one way we can deal with this matter is through an understanding of climate reparation. Now, in the El Sham Sheikh last year in Egypt at COP27, the loss and damage came into onto the table. That was a significant achievement after years of struggle of governments and civil society. Now, the problem has been, how do you operationalize this loss and damage? How do you bring it to work? And immediately after COP27, which went into injury time and beyond injury time, the climate envoy for the US said that they would never consider loss and damage as climate reparation. And that is a very significant statement. And I think because reparation includes a sense of accountability and responsibility. And they don't want to accept that they are responsible for the problem. And so loss and damage may end up being another avenue for charity. And if it's an avenue for charity, it's not going to be significant. But if we recognize that the climate debt, and may reparation for it, that would be true climate justice. And then vulnerable nations and territories can rebuild resilience, they can adapt to the challenges, and we can begin to recover from the impacts of global warming. And I think that is a major ask that nations should be making, recognition and payment of climate debt as a beginning for real restoration and recovery. Uh, and so that we can have an understanding that we're not looking for, nobody's looking for charity. And the money is available. I always like to remind us myself that the money is available when I look at how much money is spent on warfare every year. Globally, $2.4 trillion spent on warfare and armament every year. And the rich countries spend a chunk of that, you can imagine. And the emissions from the military is, is national, is voluntary for nations to mention to, to account for the emission from the military. Now, some don't just talk about it at all. So the military is, as far as climate justice is concerned, is completely, you can say, outlaws. And so I want to thank you for your attention. And I can go on forever, but prudence requires that at the point we take a pause. Thank you very much.